If I told you that UK property was radically underpriced, you might think, this guy must have a company that sells property, which is true. You might think, I must be a complete moron, which is also arguably true. Or you might think I'm being controversial just to get YouTube views, which I rigorously deny because getting more views does not lead anywhere positive. But there are flaws to the common argument that property is unaffordable. And there's another way of looking at the same data that shows it might actually be historically cheap. So we'll go through both of these, but bear in mind, this isn't a forecast. I'm not saying that prices are gonna go up soon. I don't know, nor does anyone else. And if you're investing for the long term, it doesn't really matter. But the purpose of this video is to give you a different potential perspective that you can factor in when making your own decisions. The argument that houses are overvalued is often backed up with a chart like this. And it seems persuasive enough to lay the entire argument to rest. In 1997, a house would cost around three and a half times the average person's earnings. And that was pretty typical going all the way back to the 70s, even though you can't see it on this chart. Now, it's on track to be 6.3 times. London and the South East are even more extreme, of course. The argument that prices are way too high assumes that the last 20 years have been a bubble, and at some point they have to come back down to the long-term historical average ratio. And it's a persuasive argument that might be right. But does it have to come back to the average? There are a few reasons to think that the current ratio can and will be maintained forever. The first reason is this is looking at average earnings for an individual. And of course, in the past, it was common for an individual to buy a first house or flat on their own. Now, it's much more common to buy as a couple. Admittedly, this is largely because property prices boomed so much in the first place and it became unaffordable to do otherwise. But it's also partially a result of everyone hitting all the normal milestones later in life anyway. When you look at household real disposable income, it's grown by 44% since 1997, which I assume is largely driven by a growth in dual income households. So using an individual's average earnings might not be the appropriate measure to use these days, meaning it's natural for the multiple to rise and stay high. You also need to look at the length of mortgage term, with 50% of first-time buyer mortgages being taken out for at least 30 years now, compared to less than 20% in 2007. Longer mortgages spread out repayments for longer, making higher monthly interest payments more affordable. Again, chicken and egg. This is probably as a consequence of house prices increasing so hugely between roughly 1997 and 2007, but now this is normal, it supports prices remaining at a higher earnings multiple. Of course, there's also the small matter of getting the deposit together, but there's a new force operating here too, with family contributions now supporting nearly half of all first-time buyer purchases, up from 30% in 2006. You've also got to bear in mind, what's the alternative? Even though the cost of buying has gone up dramatically over the past couple of years due to mortgage rates, so is the cost of renting. Renting is now marginally cheaper than buying for the first time since 2010, but not by much and not in every region. Given the general unpleasantness of the rental market, there's still a desire to buy. I'll acknowledge again that everything I've just covered is largely a consequence of a big increase in prices in the first place. But now that those conditions are in place, they might not change. House prices are notoriously sticky downwards. People get anchored to the high watermark and won't sell for less unless they're forced to. So you've got first time buyers propped up by more household income, longer mortgages and family support, plus around 30% of all households who own their home outright and won't be inclined to take a cut. Given all that, can you just look at a house price to income chart and say, oh, prices need to come down by 40%? In London and to a lesser extent the South, I think you can say that the ratio did rise way too far, which is why it's been coming down sharply in London since 2016, as you can see. But for the country as a whole, I'm not convinced. Clearly, the entire impact of the recent rise in interest rates hasn't filtered through yet, but probably nor is the impact on real wage growth, so you could say the jury's out for another 18 months or so. So far, I haven't made the case that property is cheap, just that current price levels in relation to earnings can potentially be maintained forever, and a high ratio doesn't automatically mean a crash is long overdue. But undervalued? To make that argument, we need to look at house prices in real terms, that is, after adjusting for inflation. Nationwide puts this data together, with the red line being a trend line fitting the data from 1975. This shows that the trend is for 2.4% growth in property prices above inflation each year. The data was tight to that trend until the early 90s, after which there have been three distinct phases. A fall in the early 90s, a boom into 2007, then pretty much a flat line since then. Recent general inflation, paired with small house price falls, have taken them, in inflation-adjusted terms, back to where they were in 2013, and now significantly below trend. So on this basis, prices are historically undervalued, and you'd expect them to pick up from here. 
Of course, you could easily pick holes in this. Can a long-term growth trend of more than 2% above inflation really be sustained? After all, if you go all the way back to the 1800s, you see average annual real growth of 1.1%. But given everything we've covered, the desire to own, more dual-income households, parental health, the lack of building relative to population growth, which is one of the reasons rents have been going up so much, it's not as crazy as it first sounds. Again, this is not a prediction. I've been trying to argue against my own points the whole way through because I don't know what's going to happen, which is why I choose to invest in such a way that whatever happens over the next one to three years makes minimal difference to me. But I do think there are three important lessons to take away from this. First, I'm not saying we should throw out the house price to income ratio, but it's clearly not perfect and you can't use it alone to argue that house prices are way overvalued. Second, you can pull out data to support whatever argument you want to make. Just place the house price to income chart alongside the nationwide real terms chart. They both tell a totally different story. You really do need to be humble about your ability to predict what's ahead and not get locked into a narrative based on a small number of data points. And third, so much is lost when you look at nominal prices, meaning the price you actually pay, rather than inflation adjusted prices. So watch this video next, where I go deeper into this idea and explain why, when you look through this lens, a huge property crash is actually well underway.